consecutive time, not on how do I navigate the system, where are the assignments in this class versus that class versus the other class, and more time on actually the content of your course that you want to get across. So Canvas does that very nicely, right? <coughs> if you were in D2L, you had a lot more control over how your opening page looked, right? You could have the assignments on this side, you could have the assignments on that side, you could have the assignments down at the bottom, you could do all these different things. In Canvas, it doesn't let you do that as much. There's still some level of control, but some of the control has been taken away from us. From us. This benefits the student because instead of having to decide, instead of having to figure out what all these different things are, they can just focus on, on the content. Um, but it can be frustrating for us. Excuse me for one second while I plug in because I forgot to do that. Um, while we're waiting, my name is Julie Johnson. I work for Dewitt Academic Technology. I work with John. We work with the Active Teaching Lab um, and a few other programs here on campus. So if you have any questions, um, let me know. I've been working with Canvas now for over a year. Um, and also, I wanted to make sure I got everybody checked in. Did I get everyone's name? Did I badger you for your name? OK. Um, and then if anyone needs any handouts or anything at any time, raise your hand and I can come help. Um, anyway, so that's why I moved to Canvas. That's one of the reasons I'm sure that we saved money on it as well instead of running D2L and Moodle, and um, that's actually a big thing. Moodle is technically free, but you have to keep it up, run the servers, hire an internal staff to take care of all of those things. Um, so we're sort of streamlining and making things simpler all around. There are still some hangups that they are trying to figure out. As I mentioned earlier, question sets in Moodle, for example, don't work as well. Um, one of the biggest problems is we all got used to D2L or Moodle. And now we've got to learn something new. And it's in between semesters or it's, we don't have the time to do that, right? And it's hard because it's a new system for us. It's like learning a whole new language in some ways. That's where this session comes in. Um, and we hope we can help. So let's start off. Um, if you could, I'd like you to follow along in Canvas and have an experience of what your students experience, or a potential way in which your students might experience some course that they were taking this course follow. Um, what we've done all this week, we've got all of these different training sessions, or I guess we call them training sessions, sessions on Canvas. Um, some of these are pedagogical sessions. This one, for example, that we're in today is less about which buttons to push. There will be some resources on how to do that. Um, mostly at the end, and in this handout that you have. So even though it's not really buttons to push, it's more of when to push the buttons and why to push the buttons, and how to organize things. If you want to do the how do I get started, we've got the getting started class, the migrating Canvas class, we'll talk about that. Managing grades was this morning, but there will be another one coming up. All of the sessions are both on that front page. There's a handout here as well. And if you go to canvasinfo.wix.edu, there's a link on the top of the page here. Um, there's an event. All of these events are available with more information and descriptions. So come back this week and next week. Find the sessions that work for what you need done. Um, one of the challenges is that we only have two hours. So I cannot give you a comprehensive course in that amount of time. So there are things that I'm focusing on here. And I'm sorry if I don't meet your needs. Um, I'm going to try to meet your needs as we do this. So if you filled out the survey, we can see here that, I think, let's see, we've got a red is dislike. All right, I did this wrong. I did too many categories for this. Um, but purple is like. OK, that's good. Orange is like. So we've got about half people that like it. And this blue one, I don't know. Not very nice. Is that those, is that, how about the, how about the light blue? Nobody. Oh, that's nobody? This is a no spray thing. All right, 22% of you, no spray in Canvas? Well, you can. I hope, hope your time here is good. We've got some of the class sizes here. A couple of you that have large, huge classes. 
uh, some large classes, several, or about half of you with uh, 20 or, or so. <coughs> That's good. You do lecture a lot. That's fine. Lecture can be great. Face to face discussion is fantastic. Online discussion, all fabulous. Um, slides and videos, that's mostly what we're going to be doing. Ooh, who does the H5P stuff? What do you think? Um, I'm sorry, I'm on my accent. I'm, I'm having a challenge in, I've done H5P interactions with Lloyd or Black Chuck or what might be too big to encounter that as well. Right, because mm -hmm. H5P does not yet play in mm -hmm. the grade book. Mm -hmm. um, so there are other ways that you have to work around. Yeah. They just introduced the Moodle, interesting, interestingly, a Moodle integration, but we're not needing them anymore, so oh well. Uh, let's see. Problem based learning, this is a huge one. If you're not doing problem based learning, man, you should do it, because students learn so much when they work together on these really difficult problems. And it's amazing because the negotiations that happen in those student groups, they can be frustrating, right? We've all been in groups that are frustrated, but at the end of the week, we learn something from it. And that's, that's very powerful, and we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Student curated and student created, uh, these are both things that will save you time. Think about it. You spend a lot of time finding examples, models, things like that to share with your students, right? What if you gave them the assignment of, hey, we just learned this concept. Go find an example. Go find your favorite example of it. No two examples can be the same, so the first person who does it can choose the easiest one. The second person has to work a little bit harder, and the person who does the, the last work that works you know, five minutes before class starts, they've got to scramble. They scramble the first time, second time they won't scramble as much, and the third time they'll get figured out. But now you have 20, 40, 200 examples that you can use next semester. Now you won't be able to use them all because some of them will be terrible because students don't always fully understand the concepts that they think that they understand. But of those 200, there might be a couple of really good gems and you just save yourself all kinds of time. We're going to talk about harnessing the students to create, to teach each other so that you don't have to as much, to create some of the course content so you don't have to as much, and this is where the efficiency really ups um, for teaching, right? Because we can get other people to do our work for us. So, and then, oh, we even have some field work. I didn't know if anybody would do that, but great. All right, so I've run through some of these already. Some of these questions you might want to stick around at two or what time, three o'clock, and we will be able to answer some of these. And if you have other specific questions, we can help you do that. If not, um, maybe you'll find answers here. Or ask the people around you. And this is me getting you my job easier by saying, hey, ask the people next to you. They're smart people. All right. So we have a question for afterwards. Okay, I love H5P. We're not going to talk about it in, um, in this session, but I do want to point you to some resources. Um, we have these active teaching labs that Juliet mentioned, where we invite instructors to come in and tell their teaching story. And we've had a couple people come in and talk about how they use H5P. Um, those are all online available as videos, and we have takeaways and handouts so that you can step through um, things individually at whatever your comfort level with H5P is. Um, and we'll have more of those as well. But again, that won't be in this session, sorry. All right, so that's that. You all have this handout, um, both as a um, paper <laughs> version, and you can follow along that way, one of the things that I'd really encourage you to do is, as we go through this, 
I have down here, and we'll go through this in Canvas as well. You got all of these examples here. These examples will go directly to here's how to do this. I cannot show you an example for each thing because we don't have enough time. So it is your responsibility to go in and click on the ones that sound like they might work for you. And if you have time, put it down the next even if it doesn't sound like it might work because you might be surprised. And use your imagination to see if you can figure out a way to make it work. All right, that's that. Each of them I've talked about, we should have done it. Who chose that? Good job. So there are a couple of ways that I'm going to, um, that I've, sort of layers that I've structured the time that we have right now, and I'm two minutes behind right already, so we're going to try to rush through this in some ways. Again, I'm going to ask you to rely on in the Canvas course. There are many ways that I've represented this information. We're going to talk about multiple means of representation, engagement, and expression, which are the main facets of universal design for learning. So we're going to revisit that as we talk about the learning principles. So the way that I, um, and we're going to use this absorb, do, connect, or any of you familiar with Horton's framework for, um, what would it be, teaching and learning, I guess. But the idea is that you give the students something to absorb. So I stand up my lecture for five minutes, right, ten minutes. And then I give an activity for you to apply. That's the do. And then finally, I say, all right, now let's connect. And let's connect with what we've done before. Let's connect with your personal um, interests and motivations. Let's do some other types of connections. So absorb, do, connect. And that's the way that the sections of today will um, go forward. So starting off with universal design for learning. How many of you have heard of universal design for learning? Anyone? Excellent. How many of you have heard of universal design? Okay, good. How many of you have, um, oh, there's my summary. So preview of what I'm going to talk about here. This is a big one. Oftentimes it works for us. So we're going to do it that way. But we sometimes forget to look around and realize that the people that we're teaching has much different um, expectations, motivations, etc., than what we have. I'm going to get this on all the, all the things that can be on your top as well. All right, how many of you have seen curb cuts at sidewalks? Right, every sidewalk intersection has that little scoop out, right? Uh, who uses those? Let me ask the first question. Who were those designed for? People with wheels. People with wheels. Specifically, people who need to use them because they have to stay in wheels, right? Who uses them? Everybody. Everybody uses them. Um, skateboarders, right? Skating along, they don't have to jump the curbs that way, right? But they like to do that. People in the strollers, pushing kids. Uh, very small people, uh, children who can't step over the curb yet, right? Um, the elderly who might have walkers or who also can't step over curbs or have trouble with curbs, they can do that, right? Universal design came out of an architectural need for this thing. How many of you use elevators, right? Can you imagine the world without elevators? Would that height tall exist if we did not have elevators? No, a lot of, so, you know, who wants the fifth floor office or the 14th floor office without an elevator. We use elevators even though we don't necessarily need to, right? But universal design came from this sort of idea. Universal design for learning takes the same sort of idea and says, you know, we can accommodate the people that we need to accommodate in our classes. We should all, by law, be accommodating people with disabilities in our classes. So why not just accommodate everybody? Why not just build in things automatically so that we don't have to do these extra little one-off accommodations, we we'll just build it directly into the, the curriculum, build it into our course. There are a couple ways of doing this. 
as a means of engagement. How do we get them interested? How do we get them motivated so that we don't have to keep yelling at them and cajoling them to learn, but they're actually eager to learn because you've done a good job of connecting with their prior experiences, their prior motivations, um, to spark their interest. If we can do that, that's great. The one way of doing that spark everybody's interest? Probably not. What worked for us might not work for the people in your classroom. They come in with different interests. So we need to have multiple forms of interest. Multiple means of representation. I might understand that a house looks the way that my house looks like. Will that work for everybody else? When I say, oh, the crawl space underneath your house, da 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 da, you might be like, I don't have a crawl space, I'm really talking about. So, multiple forms of representation. Can we figure out different ways of representing the material so that they can, all of your students, get a good, not similar, not the same, but a similar idea of what you're talking about? And then multiple means of expression. If we just give one huge written test at the end, some people are going to have a great at that, right? I was very good at taking essay tests. Um, some people are not good at taking essay tests. That doesn't mean they're not as smart. That means that they prefer to express things in other ways. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, but in my field, they need to know how to express things in this way because that's how our field does it. True. Do they need to do that from day one as a student? Or can the student's learning time be a little bit more flexible to get them to that point? I would encourage you to think that yes, it can be. And I would also say that, I would say that can. The multiple means of engagement, representation, and expression. This is the campus survey from 2015 of what um, disabilities there are on campus. When we think about disabilities, often, most of campus did anyway, they thought of the ones that, um, they thought of the visual impairment, they thought of mobility impairment, those were like the top rated ones. But in actuality, they're really not very, there aren't a lot of them. What's really big are these other ones. And they're much harder to see. When you look around the classroom, they're not as visible. This is why it's really important to just make it structural, make these accommodations, if you want to call them accommodations, build with these multiple, build this universal design into your course because you can address these things a lot easier. 92% of students, 92, not 92% of the students, but 92% of the students who have disabilities who have reported, self-reported, have a disability in 2015. Those are the invisible ones. So there's a very good chance that you have them every semester in your courses, and you don't even know about it. So what can you do to help us? Yeah. Is the Learning Center um, to, to go get certificates? Yes, and that's what. I, I've had several in my classes, so. Yes. It's up to the students to seek out this. Uh, very good point. It is up to the students. Many of the students don't want to do that because they're ashamed of it or they feel like, oh, I just have a small disability. It's not that big of a deal. I can deal with it. It's absolutely true. Um, but should everybody have to do that? Question one. And question two, if we address it up front into the structure of our class, then we can get to a point where they don't have to do that extra step. And when I make these other cur curb cuts into all the curves, then we don't have people saying, oh, I need help with this because then that brings extra undue, unnecessary attention to the individuals, um, in my opinion. So universal design talked about the what, the how, and the why of learning, or the different ways represent material, the different ways for the students to express material, and the different ways to get the students interested and engaged in the material. And if you think of the multiple means, think about the stop sign. This is such a great illustration. We could have stop signs that look like this, right? Said stop. And it's actually multi-mode because it's also red, right? But 
if people are colorblind, they might not see the red, right? If people can't read or is dyslexic or have reading issues that aren't super bad, they might not be able to see this. And if there's some sort of division, uh, impairment, you might not be able to see this. But because this is both white on red, octagonal, and um, well, I guess what it is. It's the shape, it's the color, it's the word. Three different modes to get this point across that you can stop. Very simple example, and that's multimodal. What we found, can I open the next slide? No. What we found is, we just backed this up, um, captions on videos. Very simple thing, right? Not very simple thing. It's a pain in the butt to do captions on videos, right? But when we do those, the people who benefit from them are not just the people who can't hear the video, they're also the people who like to get the audio reinforced with the visual. How many of you watch, I regularly watch TV now with captions on, just because it's, it's easier. Sometimes I have a hard time understanding things and or I'm distracted because the dog's jumping on me or, or something else is happening or my wife is talking to me, but now I can sort of absorb more better if I have the captions on. Again, these things we build into our classes help everyone. The multiple means of engagement. We often think that when I was in school, learning my trade, and we've all gotten to a point in our life where we are specialists, right? We found something that we're good at, that we like, and it works for us, and here we are, right? Your students aren't there yet. They're still in that exploratory stage. Some of them have declared major, but it's still, they're still not with this. They haven't got it all figured out. They aren't able to make the connections that we've made right away, or we've made actually through trial and error, but now they're very firm connections. Help the learners find their way. Build in exercises for them to connect to their prior knowledge. Even if their prior knowledge is totally different. Maybe they have an uncle who is in this field. Maybe they have um, a, a, a mother who has uh, an issue that your field deals with. Maybe there's something in their life that can connect to your field through the context that you're teaching. Help them find that. That should be part of, I think, part of the initial part of your semester is how do you how do you relate to this content? Let's talk about this content. Figure out what your connection is to make it personal to you. Because once the content is personal to them, it's easy for you because they're hooked. Multiple means of representation. Once they're hooked, that does not guarantee that they will be able to, um, it doesn't mean that they will be able to understand concepts right away. They still need to figure out how to, how to make this content personalized, and they, excuse me, it's going on my head right now. I totally forgot the introduction. You guys know that I'm going to introduce the topic, and instead I just jumped right into the content. Um, so now I'm sitting up here going, oh, God, I don't know what happened. So, man. All right, we're going to take a minute after after I get through the rest of Dr. Lou, and we're going to do that. And it'll actually work out great because we're all different, and this is all about addressing differences. So it's perfect. <laughs> I started that way. Begin learners opportunity to solve problems that are meaningful and personally relevant to them, then they're on they're on their way and they can start to fill in a lot of the information and solve the problems that you don't have to solve at that time. And again, they enlist other students to help them. Give them in groups, have them work with each other, against each other, um, things like that, and correct each other. They will not be able to correct each other everything, all the mistakes that each other makes. 
right? You're still going to have to go in and do some guidance. But you'll be doing a lot less guidance than if the student is sitting correctly. Okay. All right, and then finally, the most reason of expression. Um, there will be some times when you need to have things done in a certain way, right? This is just for basic efficiency. If, if I have to grade papers, I can grade them all consistently, right? If I have to grade a paper and a video and a sculpture and a dance and you know all of these other things, now how do I how do I grade all of these different things that are very different? Plus, the sculpture and the dance they don't work in my field. Nobody presents that way, right? So why should I let the students do that? The trick with this, and I'll get into this a little bit later as well, is to figure out a rubric that is broad enough to cover the important elements of your set of your topic, rather than focus on are the margins of inch, are there the right number of words. If they cover it, they cover it, regardless of how they cover it. And make the rubric, attach the rubric to the content, to the important elements of the content, so that they demonstrate and eventually, once they get comfortable with this, and they say, okay, I guess I do get it via dance, so I understand the content, now I can take my comfort, I'm comfort at this point, I can move into this other format for writing the paper, which I'm not so comfortable with. But they more have to do that because they know that they've got the content already. All right, this, It's one of my favorite examples of multiple means of Facebook representation and expression. This is for a biology 150 class. Um, and what they decided to do was for the whole semester, they said, hey, we're all familiar with these. We're all familiar with these. Um, tutorial videos in our field, right? Where you click the button and you learn a concept, and they're often done very professionally, and sometimes kind of boring, where it's like, notice the thing here. Do you see how it does da 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 And they're not great, necessarily. They have their students go in and create their versions of this. And some of them use Legos to talk about the founders effect and other things in, in biology. Some of them use stop motion, actually it's quite a few stop motions, some of them went into their dormitory and said, hey, the replication of virus X, this is like, and this wouldn't be, I think, um, so great these days, it's kind of like a, a, a takeover and a shooting of a dormitory, right? Obviously they had fun doing this. Um, <laughs> and they have the basic story or metaphors right. The metaphors that all of these break down, obviously. Right? But to the point that they work, they're kind of a fun way of doing this. The students got a chance to work together. Um, they will all tell you that they did not necessarily always have fun because putting together any of these things in a group is going to be a bit of a pain at times. But at the end, they're all proud of what they did. And they've produced something that they can now send and show their grandmother. They can show their friends back home, things like that. And that's kind of neat. The way that they sent this um, as a process, they pitched the idea to the students. They said, OK, this is what we're going to do. They had the students come up with an idea. They all came up with their ideas. They grouped them together to find overlapping ideas. And those are the groups. The groups then pitched, came up with a storyboard and pitched that idea to the rest of the class. The class said, oh, that sounds good. All right, again, you're having the students help each other figure things out. They're pitching ideas. They're learning from each other when they're pitching the ideas. So that's fun. And then they gave the students, and they had to define the storyboard and present it to a professor to make sure that they got the story right, the metaphors right. So 
So these are all sort of, they're not just student interpretations, they've been guided, they're approved by the professor in the class. They put together a rough cut, they tested it out with another group, and then at the end, they had a final cut, they rented out the, the play theater in Memorial Union, they got popcorn, they had to invite their family and friends, and they just had a celebration one night where they had a little mini film festival with their class put together. What a fun final project. All right, let's get back to what we should be doing now. If you open up your course right now, the Canvas course you should all be in, and then you click on the overview button. What I've tried to do, and you guys are all my guinea pigs on this, so in the evaluation for today, please tell me if I succeeded or what other suggestions you have. What I've tried to do is I've tried to create a course that would be useful both as an online course and as a face-to-face -face course that we have here today. And I've got little smiley faces, those face-to-face -face sessions, and if you've got the computer, even though you're well using our computers here today, those are mostly the online sessions. So in the modules, um, you'll see these uh, designated as well. For the face to face time that we have today, let's do this abbreviated page. Follow it all. Hey, John. Yeah. Can you show again one more time how you got to your overview? Yeah. So, from the homepage, you mean? Yeah. From the homepage, I just clicked on an overview for the applying the learning principles in Canvas. There. And then after the session, you can go back and read through all of this and go through the online version alone if you would like. Um, the online version doesn't have the face to face activities that we're going to have today. Um, so, I'll use the video page instead. And look at that right there, because I didn't use it. My introduction. So, let's go ahead and do these introductions. Um, I could have had. How many of you love icebreakers? No, me neither. <laughs> um, but they are important because they help you understand what, who we are. Um, the main guys also help. So just in your tables, introduce yourselves. Why are you here? What do you want to learn? Things like that. And I'm going to try to list those there. OK? So let's spend five minutes doing that. Six, six minutes doing that because there are six people at tables.
I was driving home at like eight in the morning. Because I started in college, but here we are. 
Here we are in Kansas. We've just done introduction. So this might, in theory, this will help you follow along with what we're doing right now, right? And now we get into the content, but doing that, I already did the Universal Design for Learning section. Um, I'm going to go back to that real quick because I gave you the slides, but I did not go through this. So again, this is a, ideally a form of multiple means of representation because you can sit and listen to me and, and watch and go through the slides with me, or if you like to scan ahead, you can scan ahead as well. The content is for the most part here on the page, so afterwards, um, you can go back to your room and study and say, what did we do? Because I was actually watching the game with my handheld device instead. <laughs> uh, and you can go catch up there. So there are the slides. I don't know if there's that. You know, design. And this is all essentially the information that I just spoke at you. Right? Yeah. Like the question but we did not do this yet. <coughs> and this is where I'd like you all to do this collaborative Google Doc. And if you link on, click on that link, I'd like you as the table to come up with a list of high-level ways to provide flexibility for all students. Now, when you click on this link, it should open up. Please tell me if it doesn't. I guess we, I, I can't find the link. So how did you get here? Yeah. It's All right, so no, we're on the yeah. Universal Design Framework okay. page. And this is actually just to no. know because, <laughs> you know, the problem of leading people in a step-by-step -step thing across multiple pages is that it's hard sometimes for everybody to click on the same multiple pages that you're on. So an even more linear path might might have been better here for this. Mine says view only, but this is where they say that. Oh, I can't get my. Okay. Is that correct? For everybody on view only? Yeah, I went to. Yeah. 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 Yes. 
Here's a hint. <laughs> Look at other people's tables. Exactly Still their ideas. Change it for you. You guys are table five. You guys are table three. It's like table four is the empty unless you guys want to. So where did you click to get on? Can we help you? Yeah. <laughs> so I never got, um, I got an email after I registered, mm -hmm. but I don't have the sandbox course in my, in my camera. Did you see the page by Tiffany? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So self-enroll, and then let me know if you get lost trying to find where we are. It needs to be capitals on those last. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>
All right, let's finish up in the next minute here. And if you have already looked through your own tables with uh, stuff, start looking through other people's tables. <coughs> this may be controversial, but go ahead and add other ideas, other ideas for advantages. If somebody is doing something, and uh, they don't have an advantage for the instructor. And, oh, by the way, this also helps you because of X, Y, or Z. Or that mm -hmm. there's another student advantage that you missed. Uh, for example, John has one here on video lectures. The advantage for the student is that they can do it at their own time. Yeah. Another advantage is they can put the speed, change the speed on it to do it at half speed. Regular speed, one and a half speed. Um, they can pause and rewind and go over what they just think that they might have missed. Um, they can stop and go get a make, make fun of it. Make fun exactly. <laughs> All of these things. So there are a lot more advantages than you might be able to figure out, but somebody else can be able to uh, might be able to come up with them. So go ahead and add other advantages that you can come up with. That's your question. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, yeah. is this my computer or what's yeah. my app? I'm just totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, when I said I had the view only, mm -hmm. and then I had to close it, and now I've just spent this whole time trying to get back into the table, but I can't even. Like, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's been taking forever. Yeah. I can't see anybody typing anything or I see my table mates. Sure. So you can tell it's kind of technology. Yeah. 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 Y
Are there any that will work for you that you didn't come up with? Okay. Okay. Are there any that you want to know more about? I like the idea of having final projects that people see through the choose your own adventure final project. I think that can be very fun and interesting. Also, from a grading perspective, um, section 20 is the best part of the thing. That's what it's grading. So there is that, right? And this is actually a benefit for the instructor of having multiple means. Um, man, the hundred. Well, the tenth paper, you start getting bored, right? Mm -hmm. If you were, you know, to interrupt the paper with a video, that might be a nice little break for you mm -hmm. as an instructor, yeah. Um, and I've actually done this for my ed psych classes for um, early childhood development. Um, we usually have a lot of nursing students, and so one of the I give them a bunch of ideas because sometimes students panic at the idea of choose your own adventure, right? <laughs> um, so one of the ideas that I give is um, if you're a nursing student and you you know, want to start applying your skills early, I have them think uh, uh, or actually create a, um, a nursing curriculum and pretend like they're a nurse in an early, you know, a preschool or whatever. And they come up with like a healthy eating curriculum or something like that. And they actually apply what we learn in class sort of in this sort of big project way. Um, and yeah, it's, it's turned out really well. Um, I've had students do movies, I've had um, performance art, I've had uh, visual art. I usually have students write a paper along with any kind of art form, um, but yeah. And this brings up a really good point that just because the students want to submit something that will not work in your field, right, uh, maybe it will work in their field and they're just taking your class to help them with their actual direction. They don't want to become a whatever is neurologist that you are, um, but they want to take from that knowledge and use it in their field. And that, that would be a really good empathetic thing for you to be able to, to let them do that to honor um, their learning path. So good point. Other things that stuck out. Okay, can I ask uh, for a volunteer, somebody who, this is their first time ever using Google Docs um, in a collaborative fashion like this, and wherever you are, can you share um, how was the chaos of this experience? experience. Yeah, anybody, yeah, anybody, especially if it was your first time. Once you see what's going on, it's, it's not too bad. So the first time, super chaotic, right? Where am I, what am I doing? Maybe the second time, okay, you did this last week, we can do it again. The third time, oh, this again. I know how to do this. And then on and on. So make it a regular part of your teaching practice. Um, it's just part of the norm. So were you, I'm oh, no, I was asking what you, if you had yes, time. Yes, yes, I thought you were. I know there were a few of us having some technical difficulties. Um, like my cursor, I had to click like slightly above every sentence in order to get to the part of the sentence I wanted to. I don't know if anyone else had that. Um, we had some other folks that couldn't see anything happening on the page. Um, well, Good. I'm not sure it's related to it, but uh, it hangs for a long time in the Google Doc and then it shut down and then it's now not working. Interesting. And now it's not working for you. But maybe it's my computer problem. I've been doing it for a while. Does anyone else have that problem where it's hanging? Well, I did in yep. Godzilla, but then I switched to Chrome and it didn't. Ah. Google oh, Docs okay. works better with Google Chrome. <laughs> 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 oh, how about that? I guess I have a question. In a long, narrow lecture hall with 80 students, where you can't sit at any tables, so is there a, does anybody have a quick tip for? How you organize people into groups, and what if people just bring their laptop and just people can get together with somebody else? Yep. But Are you talking about that in your group session? Yes. Your session? Yeah. So there is a way um, that you can create a Google Doc and then assign it to the groups within Canvas. So mm -hmm. Canvas has this really great feature where it can automatically generate groups for you, um, which really saves you a lot of time if you don't really care who is in what group. 
Um, so you would select that feature and you assign the same Google Doc to each group and when they open up that Google Doc in their group feature area, um, it opens up a new Google Doc for each separate group. Um, so so I'll be covering that on Thursday. Thursday, yeah. So you would tell them all, you should always have <coughs> the group in lecture. Okay. Yeah, I mean, or if, uh, or maybe that's an activity that you're doing outside of class, mm -hmm. um, so students can collaborate, you know, via long distance after class. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. I think Google Docs is one of the things that has changed group work. Um, so you no longer have to meet in your with people that live across campus or live off campus or whatever. Um, you no longer have to um, send files back and forth from computer, you know, via email. And oh, I don't have Microsoft Word. I use Apple Pages, and well, I can't open that page. So can you send it back to me as a rich text format? or vice versa, you know, things like that. Google Docs, for the most part, unless you're in Missoula, kind of thing, uh, it works. And um, it's getting better, and it's certainly uh, better that way. Um, let's see, what else was I gonna ask about that? So, did you also notice what was happening at the table? You guys were not just filling up this on your own, you were talking back and forth with each other, you were sharing ideas with each other. I saw people helping each other, figure out the technology of this. Um, that kind of informal learning, even if it's not necessarily all content related, um, really helps build your learning cohort because now you start to trust each other. Like, oh, so-and-so helped me. That's good. I'm going to talk to them. They're my friend. Right? And that's so important as classes um, start to develop and they go on. So having these things, they're chaotic. Sometimes they go awry. Um, Usually the first time you go awry, the second time less awry. If you can suffer through those first few times, then they can really become a great issue, a great, great classroom practice. All right, let's move on. And you have this now, so we can go back to at any point and steal other people's ideas, add to them, develop them, things like that. And we've already seen this example. I've got a list to the playlist. If you want to see all of those videos, some of them are great, some of them less great. Um, but what do you expect? They're early career students, so they, they haven't figured it all out yet. But they have a good job. All right, so that is that. And now, at the bottom of the page, we click on the next button. We'll go to the next thing and see what's there. All right, good learning principles. This is why we're here. So the universal design is sort of the structure to have multiple means of all of these things that now that we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna have us watch this video. Uh, which is it in the first grade? Yeah, I'm here, hello, my name is professor at Arizona State University, and I'm very interested in how uh, good video games, including good commercial entertainment video games. We talked about video uh, games, but I want you to substitute good, good learning management first How they teach people problems and to become good learners. We're going to discuss a set of <coughs> 13 principles uh, that are good learning principles that games use to hook people on learning and to engage them for the long haul in uh, learning. The principles will fall into three categories. The first category is empowered learners. Nobody learns anything unless they choose to do it and feel that they're going to have an effect in doing it and feel that what they do is going to matter uh, and be good for them. So we have to first create empowered learners. We're going to discuss how games uh, do that. Then we're going to discuss games as a form of problem-based learning. You know, too often today in school, learning is just about facts and information and passing tests. People can't solve problems with their knowledge, and yet you can't be an effective citizen, you can't be an effective person in the world if you can't actually solve problems. So we really want to push problem-based learning, and games are nothing more than good problem-based learning with a, an outcome, a win state, where you know, you know when you have solved. 
So we're going to discuss problem. Uh, we're going to discuss principles of good problem-based learning. And the third uh, uh, area where we're going to have principles is how do you create deep understanding? That is not superficial understanding. You know, most knowledge we get in school only lasts six months to a year. Afterwards, you can't do it because it's not deep. It hasn't been stored deep in your head. How do you create understanding that can last a lifetime and that can lead to and prepare you for future learning? So that will be our, our, our third set of principles to help people with understanding. All right, so he talked about video games, and when I was getting my PhD, I, was, I got a degree at UW-Madison in the curriculum department area, and he was on my committee, and it was, um, so I'm biased, and but what he says is all best by learning something. So all of these things that we're going to talk through, this is, it was kind of like just the best encapsulation of everything I learned in my doctoral minor um, in a 22 minute. 20 minutes worth of video. So I didn't even have to go through all of those classes as much. I could have just keep watching this. So the benefit for you is, is all there. Um, the rest of this is linked somewhere. There we on the page I've got other to the whole set, maybe some of the resources. Anyway, if you want to watch them all, they're all available. And if you click on the individual things in Canvas, you can, because I've set them up, go back to the same thing. Sorry. Oh, there's a link right above the video. <laughs> Now, we don't have time, unfortunately, again, to go through all of those individual things, even though they're only a minute and a half each. And they talk about 18 different ways to um, empower learners, for example. So we're going to do this instead. So we're motivated by problems that we find interesting. And it's very easy when we think about it as, as individuals. Once we're hooked, we can spend a crazy amount of time and effort. How many of you have hobbies? How many of you spend a lot of time on your hobby? How many of you get paid for doing a hobby? Yeah, yeah, maybe if we're lucky, right? If we're lucky, we can do that. But we spend a lot of time and energy on the, pro on our, on the problems in our hobbies because we're interested in it. And that's the bottom line. That's how we got to the position that we are at the university, right? In many ways, we love what we do, and we went through all of the difficult challenges of grad school, etc., to get to where we are because we have a passion for it. Now, not all of our students have the same passions that we have, right? No surprise. If you look at the colleagues in the department, you will see that a lot of you, even though you're all in the same area, you have very different interests and very different uh, motivations. So. Similarly, all of our students have different motivations as well. We're talking about intrinsic motivation. There's all kinds of research on this. Um, it says, basically, we do a better job of the things that we are paid for than we do of the things that we are paid for. Because we want to do those problems. So, today's topic is how do we do this. Here's the strategy that um, Eugene was talking about. We're going to try to do that in Canvas. Why do we do it? Think about it. The students who love what they're doing, well, they're interested because they're 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 they'll talk to you about it after class, right? And that's kind of fun. Um, they will connect other content to the rest of life. Let's get the students connect content to the rest of their lives. Integrate content into their identity. Really, what we're talking about is identity development in college, right? You go to college and you learn how to become something, right? Whatever the allergist or is, <laughs> is, that's what we're here to develop. Become part of that community. 
things are more resilient, they're more engaged. They produce more interesting work than what they produce for the context that they are either from. Unique perspectives, they inspire others, and they share their enthusiasm with their family and friends, which in the time of good and Ferguson and political pressure on the university is a good thing to have enthusiasm for learning. What's in for you? This is the better examination, uh, evaluation. The last set of questions is going to involve they engage more, they write more interesting papers or videos or whatever it is that you do. They bring perspectives to help you understand context in a different light. How many of you have experienced that? I feel like I just thought of it that way. That, is that not a cool moment when that happens? They can inspire you, they can share enthusiasm with their with, uh, for learning and for students and family, they admire you, they're more positive and resilient. This is a big one. If they love what they're doing and you mess up, that's okay, because they still love you. That's cool. So let's think about Legos and empowering learners. Legos, I think, are my favorite tool ever for figuring out um, all kinds of stuff. These are the different elements that um, he would talk to that he will talk about in this video. The code design. Can we give students agency to connect new content to things that already motivate them? Their prior knowledge, what are they walking the door knowing and being interested in? What are their current skill sets? Start there. Don't stay there, but start there. When you learn new content, you first try and sort it and understand it by comparing it to the categories, metaphors, and experience that we have previously had. We do this all the time, right? Humans do this. Pattern recognition. We see something and we just like, where have I seen this before? What does this fit into? If they haven't had the same experiences that you as the instructor have had, they cannot see it from your perspective. Those sets of patterns don't exist for them yet. So you have to help them develop that, but you have to start them off with what they do, do already. Let them give them some agency in co-designing that learning environment. Customize them. Allow the exploration of problem spaces in their own way. We have different great cases and approaches that we're comfortable with. And respect that. And give them a little bit more time and flexibility to do that. Let them customize their learning path. Now, a little side thing for those two things is any choices that you give them help them feel more in control of their learning even if it's not related to content. If it's related to click button A or click button B, you choose. That is a choice. Well, sometimes if you give them too many choices, it's an administrative nightmare for you as an instructor, and it's overwhelming for them. So there's that balance. There's that. You have to figure, you have to figure that out. But just giving them a couple of choices goes a long way. All right, the third one. Identity, provide occasions to view problem spaces from different role perspectives. Think about this in your field. Your perspective, the one that you teach from, is your perspective. And it is unique in many ways in your field. Think about those students in your class that are not like you. What are you doing to help them feel comfortable with the course content? Can you highlight the outliers in your field and say, hey, look, they didn't feel comfortable in the field either, but they did this great contribution. Here's their story. The more that the students can see themselves, whether it's gender, uh, ethnicity, or ways of thinking, um, the more that they can see different options in your field, the more they can say, maybe I do belong here. Maybe I can contribute to and that gives them more time. Give them chances to, to try that. Assign roles. Assign different roles. Even roles that are totally different from theirs. That helps them gain other perspectives as well. Manipulation. Give them real tools that you use in the field and let them play with the tools. Let them play with them to fail. Let them play with them to succeed. Ask them to fail sometimes. Ask them to re reach some non-win state uh, moments or, or goals in that tool, just so they get familiar with that tool. 
because the more that they start to play with that tool and say, oh, now I know how to do this, the more they can say, I know how to do this just as well as a person in that pool. So what can you do then to build a Thinking back about it, our learners, they can build anything they want. I, I love this picture because they're in seats and they're playing with Legos. And they're all building something different. And that's kind of neat. Why do we empower learners? We empower learners to solve good problems, to explore good problem spaces. Now, what makes a good problem space good for me might be different than what makes it good for you. Um, going back to games again, there's a nice graph of player types that I should have brought in here, but I didn't. Some people play games um, to win, to gain as many points as they want. Some people play games to explore all the different corners of the game space, the problem space that are there. Some people just play games to socialize. Like, I don't care what we're doing, I just want to do it with you because I like hanging out with you and I want to talk to you and learn from you. The explorers, the um, achievers, the socializers, and then the last one, it's the most difficult one. My brain is off. All right, the last one, these are the jerks of the game, right? Killers? They're the killers. That's it. It is, it's the killers. Um, it's a terrible name for them, though, right? But they are the people that, in video games, when you respawn, they're there saying, ha, huh, and they kill you back again, right? And they get some perverted joy. I'm thinking of bias here. <laughs> they get joy in saying, I'm better than you, da 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 da. And they just like to sort of razz and tease other people. I think there's a parallel here with learners. I think we've seen those people in our class. We've seen the people that are really interested in the problem. They don't care so much about the grade other than the fact that they care about the grade. But they'd rather just immerse themselves in the problem and start exploring that. There are the people that are just like, hey, this is fun. Let's do this together. And they learn as well. They pick up from the different learners. There are the people that will go in and argue for every half point, right? Because they want to get that top, top, top grade or all the points possible and all the extra credit. And then there are the people that will start an argument and debate people just for the sake of debating and playing devil's advocate and the joy that they get out of that back and forth. Can we build that into our class? If we can build those four categories, we will have reached a lot of our students. And some of them, you don't just do one, right? I like to explore, but I also like to achieve points. I can do it for people. That's going to be much more. Good problems look different for different people. So again, the more choices we have, the fine problem that looks good for them, the better. One way to do this, is everyone familiar with Bloom's taxonomy? Okay, so Bloom's cognitive taxonomy. I love these types of things. If you ever Google Bloom's plus verbs, you've got all kinds of great questions for each of the different levels. So if you're getting tired and you're making quizzes and you're like, Oh, I keep saying, you know, understand this and understand this, or show this. Here are some different things. Arrange this, define that, describe, duplicate, test, identify, label, list, match, memorize. Great resources available there to help you make better questions. That's what they're All right. So we've empowered learners, and we've empowered them to explore good problem spaces, a variety of them. And what we want them to do as they're exploring those problem spaces is reveal systems, right? So everything that happens ha is ruled by some sort of set of rules or mechanics or some thing, some systems um, that we try to understand here at the university, right? Are we letting the students find those or are we telling them the answer and not letting them sort of explore and figure it out for themselves. In problem-based learning, when they're digging around and trying to figure out what happens, they find the systems themselves. And when they find the systems themselves, 
it's better because it's based on your own experience rather than something that somebody said in a lecture to you at some point. In order to do that, we have to let them fail. And this is hard for educators because we want a student to succeed. This is something that video games do very well. Now you're down. You jump, you jump when you hit any phone, you just landed on it for a turtle, you hit you, and now you die. And, and you do something else, and you die. And you do it over and over and over again, and you fail, and you fail, and you fail, and you fail. And, but each time you fail, you get a little bit farther along. Can we build in high risk or low stakes failure opportunities for our students so that they constantly fail so often that it's no big deal? Because what is happening now is our students are afraid to fail. They're afraid to take risks. They want to make sure that they get it right. For lots of reasons, right? One, they don't want to pay their course. Two, who's got time during the week with all the other courses and things they've got going on to keep failing at things, right? In some ways, as a system, we are structuring for more and more success but we're forgetting to teach people how to fail. And when we forget to fail, our resilience gets less and less. And if we fail and we don't have resilience, then we start thinking, I'm just not smart. I'm just not good enough to do it. And that kills learning. Because now we're like, I'm no good at this. I'm going to go somewhere else. And maybe they are no good at this, and, and they never will be. But is that really something you want to push people away from your class? Um, at least help them get better. Um, fixed mindset versus growth mindset, any terms that anyone has heard? All right, fixed mindset, people think I'm smart, and they get to a certain point, they fail, and they're like, oh, I guess I'm not smart enough. I'm a bit smart. The growth mindset says I've worked hard, and I've achieved this level, and if I fail, well, I need to work harder. And we work harder. Now there have been studies here with um, boys and girls, and you might not be surprised to know that what we do to our girls is we say, "Oh, look at you! You're smart. You're so well behaved. You're good at this." And when they get to a certain point, and they can't do it anymore because they haven't learned. They say, "Well, this isn't as smart as I am. I'm not smart," and so they don't go any further. What we do to our boys is we say, settle down, focus, because oftentimes fourth, fifth, sixth grade boys are squirrely and hyperactive and things like that. Settle down, focus, work harder, try more, try harder, do it again, and they start hearing, I need to do more, I need to do better, I need to work harder. This has been documented, and it's, a, it's a, a terrible thing in society, but I think that we can help with that. So that we need to make sure that there are problem spaces where they can fail, and we need to understand that, um, we need to help them understand that the actions that they have cause specific interest or reactions, right? And they need to understand what those are. So we need to get, let them experience those. So these are these two things. How does the system work via my exploration? And what is the edges, what are the edges of the system look like? And I'm so mad. here um, and just like five ten minutes if you need to, five seven minutes if you need to get more drinks um, the restrooms for the men is down quite a stairs on that side of the um, stairs and for the women it's just on that side of the stairs there's also restrooms for both down the hallway and around the corner and I'll be back at 236 <laughs>
So are you going to do a, so are you going to open up a similar type of registration, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you're on the homepage already for, uh, I'm actually creating it right now. Um, so on the homepage, so these are all the sessions. We've got two weeks in the afternoon. Um, so tomorrow, um, Here's the investment session. I haven't created all of these things yet, so it's a little messy, but um, registration link should take you to the registration. Okay. Do you mind just sort of giving an outline real quick? Yeah, you, yeah. That... Also, I have um, I'm going to put it in the overview as well. So, really, I'm just going to give you guys the opportunity to talk about how to approach it. Uh, and we're going to talk about like, having a whole like sampling, distributed um, learning, um, I'm actually going to have you guys do an assignment in the Canvas. Yeah, and then I'll do a brief demo of some of the classes that I've been using. So, will you have one set up, or is that something we'll use with our sandbox? Um, well, so I'm going to, um, so actually in the same Canvas course that John is using, um, so. You'll set up, you yeah. set up a place for us to post and then for others exactly. to create Exactly. Okay. Yep, so I'll basically create an assignment just like if you guys were in my class, and I'll just put a link here, um, actually. So, the first hour, getting settled in, completing the assessment reflection, and I'll link that to an actual assignment. And, okay. So I'll leave tomorrow afternoon and then Thursday afternoon. Um, so tomorrow I'll be talking about assessment. So we'll talk about how to maybe rethink assessment in your class. Um, maybe distributing learning over smaller assignments and making the small large sets and um, also using features of Canvas to really help with the smaller mistakes assignments and maybe experimenting peer grading. So I'll actually um, have you guys do a peer graded assignment so you can experience what that's like. <laughs> um, we'll do it. I'll give you plenty of time in class tomorrow to do it. <laughs> okay, so I'll, yeah, yeah, no homework. So, yeah, and then on um, the spark there should be, um, yeah. So, so if you go to the same homepage that uh -huh. um, John gets courses in, mm -hmm. so all of these sessions. Um, so here we are today, and then here's tomorrow. So I'm the assessment one, and then if you click registration, it should take you um, straight to the registration link. There. Yeah, it looks like we have plenty of. All right. One of the things that I'd like to do is. Point your attention back to the Canvas course here, and if I could go to modules, and I want to unregister for this one. And your modules might look different, but you'll notice that there is at the top, because it's alphabetical, I think. Uh, no, it's not. For whatever reason. Uh, applying good learning principles in Canvas. That's what we're using today. 
And I've organized this essay that I could come up with. It might not be the best way possible. Um, I strongly encourage you to come back to the file management course this week um, because it's excellent. We have librarians and technologists working together to come up with really good suggestions on how to make the files that are in Canvas less atrocious. Um, how many of you have used, had good experiences with file management in Canvas or page management in Canvas? How many of you have had bad experience with it? I've, only, I've had a lot of bad experience with it because <laughs> you start uploading files and they're done alphabetically and it's just, one of the tricks that you will learn is, um, you'll see them on mine, some of these are black and some of these are gray, and on yours you'll see that they're all black and the gray ones don't appear. Big hint, take away what you don't want students to use, hide those things in settings. We'll learn how to do that and get them started or migrated or some of the other courses. But um, the fewer things you can have on the left side here for the students to get lost in, the better. And one of the things I got rid of, I would get rid of is files. And the other thing that I would get rid of is pages. And I would just have them step through the uh, modules um, at least to begin with. And some people get rid of modules too. I know a professor who got rid of all of the things on that side because she doesn't want, she just wants them to follow her page that she's designed and leave them through that way. Now, the advantage of doing that is you get this extra two inches of space um, for your content, so maybe you want to do that too. Okay, so in addition to the slide space and the little um, online laptop thing, you'll see that I've got good learning principles, and we're talking about that right now. And how to learn actually has three different ways that I've created the content. Same content, three different ways. Just in the regular page, you can go in and look at that on your own content page. Now, quick question, what gets students to look at content pages? Grades, right? <laughs> right. Um, will they look at the content page if you do not give them a grade? Maybe if they're the explorer type and they've got lots of time and they can figure it out. But otherwise, Maybe not. Maybe most likely what I would do as a kid, as a student, is I would come to class and I would be like, all right, I'll catch on because they're going to talk and I'm going to listen and I'm pretty smart. I made it here. Um, so I'm going to catch on and figure it out myself. And oftentimes I did not and I, I lost. So if you want your students to prepare for class, check out this other option, empowering learners lesson content as a graded quiz. What I did there is I took the same content that I put in the page and I made it into a bunch of quiz questions. So question one, here's a video on the content, a five minute video, and here's some text. Here's your question. Did you get it right? Did you get it wrong? You know, build in knowledge checks there. Under explore good problems, I've got explore good problems lessons as a graded survey. So making your content into a quiz is very difficult because you've got to take your quiz content, break it down into lots of little pieces, and then come up with reasonable questions on each section. And maybe you already have that, in which case, do it. But if you don't have that already, the difference between a quiz and a graded survey is that for a graded survey, they get X number of points just for taking it. So you can just have them do this and ask them any question. It doesn't matter if they get it right if it's a survey question. Um, but they have to put something in there. And if they do that, then you know that they at least opened up the page and went through, scanned it, at least maybe, hopefully. Um, but they don't necessarily have to understand it. In a grading quiz, they have to understand it well enough to get the quiz. So if you want your students to prepare for class beforehand, take the time to put, the, put them in as quizzes. Uh, and that way, you'll get a lot more people preparing for class. The easiest, by far, is to just do it as a page, as a regular page. But, less opportunity to do it. Yes, Alex? 
you demonstrate where you would click to start a new survey or quiz? Sure. Start building one. Are you ready to have the quizzes? Add a quiz. When you get to that question, it will say, what kind of quiz would you like? That was not really down here for me. What I want to do is go with practice quizzes. They're great practice quizzes for fun because they don't actually give them any points or they give them choice that's wrong, but they don't put the grade book. Great quiz, great survey, fun graded survey. I also use graded surveys. And there's an opportunity to the submission anonymous. This is pretty cool for getting feedback from your students. And why do you want feedback? So you can learn who they are, so you can better adjust their learning environment um, for them. But Students don't fill out surveys oftentimes, right? And the chances of getting some good survey responses is pretty nil, close to nil. Unless you give them some points for filling out the survey. Now usually in B2L, if you gave points for filling out a survey, they had the name attached to it and you're like, John didn't fill out the survey, or John filled out the survey and he said this about me. So I'm going to punish him somehow, or, and, and the students know this, right? They were like, I'm not going to answer anything. I'm not going to give you good, substantive feedback or constructive or critical feedback because you're going to punish me about this. You can send me that way, right? With the anonymous graded survey, you can give them five points, and they can say whatever they want, and all you know as an instructor is that they filled it out and they got five points. And Here's some feedback, but I don't know who said what. You could, as an instructor, go in, keep that grade book window open, and when, as soon as you see somebody that's completed it, go in and check all the survey responses mm -hmm. and see, oh, here's what that person said. You want to choose that's a way to sort of get around that grade and sort of the anonymity. But man, that's a lot of work, and you don't have time for that. So. This might be a really good way to get some of the feedback from the students about what works for them, what doesn't work for them, things like that. And it tells them clearly that it's anonymous if they're doing it. <clears throat> and I would even go a step further and tell them that in the instructions, explicitly in your own instructions. So that's anonymous to, you, you said it's basically the instructions are figured out. So they should assume that it's anonymous to the other students, not to yourself. It's if I'm a student, I would look at it and say, okay, this is not going to be a student, but I expect that the instructor still works. The only way that the instructor can figure it out is that you can't put that grade book open and keep watching and refreshing. And no timestamps or anything. There's no timestamps or anything, right? It's just, did it get done? I mean, yeah. For all practical purposes, it's a lot. <laughs> so, um, so, quizzes. Graded surveys um, instead of just content pages. Those are some options. Now, these empower learners, um, we're just going to, or empower learners, good problems and reveal systems. We're going to go through these very quickly because. I gave you, I think, a, a fine overview. Um, but more importantly, I want you guys to do this loop project. You get the basic idea of empowering learners, right? Give them choices, give them opportunities, things like that. Let's use Canvas to do a Padlet activity. <coughs> and in this Padlet activity, you can open it up. And individually, if you click on that, it'll fill up the whole screen. How many of you? Have you used Padlet before? Padlet embeds very nicely in Canvas. There are a lot of things that embed nicely in Canvas. Um, Padlet, H5C, TriFighter, there's all kinds of things that we talk about often or you interact with people that. But what I want you to do is, again, do some generative, generative um, stuff here and think about what can you do to empower your learners? How do you work this thing? Where is the full screen? 
this little button in the bottom corner here, click on that, you should have a new thing show up. Here's the title you can add. And there's the text you can add. And if you click on the text, you can double click on the text. You can even add formatting, you can add photographs, things like that. Okay. And yes, if you're not here already, it's on the fixed space and power delivery space, but it's right here. Click with this little show button and it pops out of the way. It disappears. So it doesn't take up extra space or this cool little thing in your so high and naturally this is from Google. Functional things like this, you can add videos, you can do, yep. And if you're still in D2L, it works fine in D2L as well. So you don't have to use Canvas or anything, you can work, work it on your own.
set it up as an instructor. Padlet.com is very easy to get an account. You can set up different backgrounds. You can set it up so it moves around. You can set it up so that it's linear, straight down. Um, this one shows more things on the screen, but you're right. It, sometimes it's almost like that Google Doc collaborative thing where I'm not sure where I'm typing because now I'm over here. So yeah, good point. Um, there's a great one called Tricider, um, which I believe is Tricider.com. And that helps make decisions. So you can put in a thing, a suggestion, and then list the pros for it, and list the cons for it, and then people can vote on it. And that's kind of a nice one. Dot storing is the third option, um, and that lets you vote on you know, what color do you like the best, red, green, blue, or what, whatever concept you like about. How many of you have used Piazza? Anyone? Talk? Oh, that was not enthusiastic at all. All right, um, that's good. Conflict. It's much more complex. Conflict. It's much more complex. So yes. Yes. It's good for discussion. Yes. Um, we got a great active teaching lab by Brian Esselman in organic chemistry who uses it, and I think does a pretty good job um, based on what I've seen in it. Um, it's hard to demo because students have to have an account. So once you have an account as an instructor can't go back in and give an account as a student. So yeah, that's a good point. Anyway, it's good. Do you have full administrator for this so you can delete and remove and yep. change and I can go in and say I don't want this this one. This one's a terrible one. I think we'll crash there and I can go and get rid of it. Sorry, person. <laughs> um these I believe do not let you do the likes or dislikes. The tri cider and dot story ones do. The different themes. Uh, reactions. Hey, look at that. There. Yes, go ahead and like those or love those. Open hearts. <laughs> All right, so that. And it's 2.54. I've done a terrible job at, at this. Um, the good news is I'm around for another hour and can help things individually. But from the introduction of learning principles, we will remember that we want to empower learners to explore good problems that reveal systems. Exploring good problems um, on your own, you can check out because all the content is online in this course. And you can watch all of the videos. I mean, James G does a much better job and has animation explaining the concepts. I don't have the advantage of having an animator behind me explaining concepts visually. Uh, so you can go do that. But basically, there are many different ways of doing problems, uh, prevent, uh, creating problem spaces. You already do a lot of that. Some of you use case studies, some of you have simulations. H5P is a good example of some of these things. Um, there are a lot of options out there. Canvas works well with them. I want to point you to, again, this handout. section of this, I have examples in Canvas. So, to empower learners, here's some co-design strategies. The profile picture that I gave you, right, that gives them some skin in the game. Um, give them a journal in Canvas. Every student can have a page. Groups can have pages. Groups have full control over what they can do in Canvas if you give them a space. So they can have their own specialized group discussions. They can work on a project in that space. They can create pages and then go back and share that 
at the end of the semester with everyone else. So it really is a very good, flexible space for providing the students with agency to go in and affect their learning. So again, lots of examples here from Apollo learners. I've got lots of examples here for supporting good problems. Um, videos, links to step-by-step um, -step instruction pages, things like that, um, and also for reviewing systems. So, yes, Adam. Uh, I have a question about the ultra collaborate collaboration. So the Blackboard Ultra? Yeah, Blackboard Ultra. So the lower left, one of the lower left options. Yes, on the, on, yep. and you can disable that or keep it on all the time. Students can set those up if you set them to different groups. That, that was my that. question, if they can set their own up. If you okay. enable that in the groups, then yes, they can. So students will use that for um, study groups, for example. Yeah. So that they don't have to meet in the library or whatever. You can also use that for office hours, or you can have a study uh, group where you're at home with your glass of wine or whatever, and the students are in the room, and if they need a process, if they need you, that's okay. You can do that from home in the comfort of your, of your home rather than setting up a time in the, in the classroom somewhere. So lots of advantages of that. And it's getting easier and easier. The last Blackboard was not very great. All right. Again, I'm here for another hour, so any individual questions, I'm happy to take there. Julie is handing out evaluations for the uh, what we were able to cover today. I almost feel like I wish that this, we had another two hours to do the rest of this, but I'm going to trust that um, you all have access to the rest of the content. This is a class we sort of gave you an overview of it, and you can go into a lot more depth if you'd like to on your own. How long will we have Sure. I don't have a mandate for the course. And it's all, feel free to share it all. It's all straight ahead of the use your attribution and help yourself. I will have to run an assessment. Julie will be running an assessment. She's great. She's way better. And she'll finish everything in about a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so don't let me keep from coming back. <laughs> I will be there, in, uh, yes, I'll be here today until 4 o'clock at least. And tomorrow I'll be around for the whole time as well. No worries. Don't worry.